All right, welcome back to the beautiful Pacific Northwest land of Platinum Coffee in PacWest Bigfoot. Uh, real quick, um, my apologies. <laughs> As I read this off, we just got back from our um, family, the Boozer family vacation um, last night. And so I am very, very oh, tired this morning. But first and foremost, thank you for some of you over on the Facebook page here that have uh, given me some well wishes for the uh, vacation. It was actually a really good time. It did rain a lot a couple of the days, but the other couple days it was absolutely beautiful. Uh, it was really awesome. And uh, I did run into a couple uh, old fishermen um, that had some pretty interesting fishing tales, but not about fishing. One of them actually said that he had seen a Bigfoot up there near Eel Lake and uh, the other one swears he saw one, but not quite sure, but he does know what he heard, and uh, so I've been given permission to <clears throat> share those encounter stories, and so I will hear shortly. Also, real quick, On the Trail of Bigfoot, I think that's what it's called. I started listening to it last night. Um, and I have to say it is pretty impressive. I really enjoy it. So I'm going to give a couple shout outs here real quick. Um, on the trail of Bigfoot, the, uh, I think it's like a five part series, six part series. Anyways, you can find it over there on YouTube. It's really, really fun. Really interesting. I suggest you guys check it out if you haven't yet. It's, um, I think the episodes are like 26 minutes. So not, not too difficult, not too. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the other is um, good shout out there to uh, Bigfoot's Wilderness, uh, doing great, doing awesome. If you guys want some other encounter stories from around the country itself, you can get on over there. And if you're looking for some of those awesome, awesome headlamps, uh, flashlights on your search out there, don't forget Through Night. Um, I am not sponsored by them. I have a uh, flashlight that I had received from them that I got from them. And I absolutely loved it, so I told him I would mention them on here and let you guys know that I do really enjoy that flashlight. So there you go. I'm not being paid to say that. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I don't do any sponsorships on here. This is just for me and you. So, speaking of that, let's get into this week's PacWest Bigfoot encounter story. The bow hunter and the Bigfoot of Central Oregon. And once again, please forgive me. It's four o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> I grew up just outside of Lapine, Oregon. It was there I saw a Bigfoot for the one and only time. And personally, that is all I needed to see of that thing, that monster ever again. I was bow hunting at the time between Paulina Peak and actually the town of Lapine when I would get the scare of my life. And, to be straight up about all this, I knew what I was getting myself into. I was warned beforehand. Here is my encounter story. I love bow hunting. I grew up bow hunting in the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> my dad got me into it back in the late 1970s and shared that passion with me as I grew up. He's still around today and thinks I'm nuts, to be honest. That is okay, though. He says it with grace and a touch of humor, but I did have a run-in with Bigfoot, and it literally charged me. I thought it was going to kill me, too. I got a great look at this thing, even though it tur I turned and ran away as fast as I could. Well, all but its face, I suppose. But here is what led up to that moment, me being charged by a Bigfoot, and why I should have known better. Bigfoot Crossing it's not just a sign. As I stated before, my dad never believed in Bigfoot. But that does not mean he never heard any weird things out in the forest of Oregon. And weird stories from some of his friends. <laughs> my dad was a lumber mill guy all of his life. And from truck drivers to loggers to foremen at the mill that came and went with time, my dad heard it all. This was especially true about a place called close to home up near Paulina Peak. Of course, a good friend of ours, who was part of the Clackamas tribe, he too told us of tales of the Bigfoot and its clans. None of the stories were good, peaceful I mean. Most of the time it was the stuff of nightmares for a kid, even back, uh, even my age back then when I would hear them. 
I can't tell you how reluctant I was to go bow hunting sometimes up that way with my dad. All those stories scared the crap out of me. Two in particular caught my attention the most. One came from Frog, our Native American friend. <clears throat> the other came from a co-worker and logger friend of my dad's and just so happened uh, and it just so happened up near Paulina Peak. Frogs was the craziest, however. It was during the gathering time that a young woman and her two children were out picking berries pretty deep in the woods, about a few miles or so from their village back then. Of course, the wild men of the woods were mostly nocturnal, he said, and would come out near des dusk to do their own hunting and gathering. He also said, like his people, the female would, uh, of the wild men uh, clans would gather berries as, um, as well while the males hunted game. Anyway... Both females and males of the clans were extremely and notoriously territorial. This was magnified a hundredfold when the young were around. It was a practice by his people to never stay out after dark. Actually, many would return just before dusk. It just so happened that it was getting into fall, and the Indian woman was so engrossed in her work that she lost track of time. While it was rare to happen, Frog said that from uh, that happened from time to time. This was one of those times. It was her children who noticed the heavy walking and grunting first. They alerted their mother, who looked up and around and noticed suddenly how dark it had become. She was in full panic mode as she heard the approaching footsteps. She hurried her children along a small foot trail back to the village as fast as possible. But it would not be fast enough, however. As the footsteps grew closer and closer, the woman decided it was time to try and save themselves, as there was no way to make it back in time. That Bigfoot was closing in, and fast. She hurried the children up a thick tree, where they hid quietly. As she started to climb, her, her children watched in horror as the Bigfoot, female, grabbed their mother by the feet and swung her into the tree next to them, killing her instantly. The children, Frog said, escaped to tell the tale of what happened. Once again, and for a long time after that, the people were never, uh, were very aware of the daylight once again. Next was Danny, my dad's old friend who was still around, and his story was even crazier. He had a little cabin up that way, out towards Paulina Peak, back in the day. A little one-roomer, of course, but it was a nice little place with a stream nearby. It was fall, and he was up hunting when he first saw Bigfoot tear out of the trees towards him and steal, steal his kill. He dropped a buck with his bow, a nice four-pointer, he'd said, when the thing came at him. It was tall, very deep brown in color. Well, the bur blur, he would call it, that came out of nowhere was a deep brown. It was on his deer in a second flat, and as it flung that whole thing over its shoulder, it looked right at him and screamed. Then it charged him. He knew if he didn't run, he was going to get to be hit or dead, so he turned and ran. Fortunately, that Bigfoot stopped and screamed again and said, he said, and he thought that that was it. The encounter was over, but that was not to be. Later that night, while he was packing up to leave the very next morning as he no longer wanted to be there, a scream louder than Hades, he said, vibrated through the cabin itself. Next thing he knew... That monster was beating the back side of the cabin and the wall it was hitting was starting to cave in. He decided to dart for the Bronco, seeing how that thing was on the back side of the cabin and he knew he could make it. He did, and he left out of there in boxers, a tank top, and the socks on his feet. It took him weeks before he, he'd head back out there to get his stuff, and he took another friend of his and guns. My dad thought he was crazy, but I I guess I should have remembered the stories. He is still around, and will send you. I will send you his story, and you can write that one up. He said. All grown up. Well, I did remember, <clears throat> but like my dad, my too was not given into fairy tales and myths of UFOs, lake monsters, and gigantic hairy men of the woods. I was a skeptic at best by the time of my own encounter. I have a kid of my own today, a daughter. She believes me and loves me uh, for me to tell her my story some nights before bed. Why? I have no idea. It still scares the crap out of me. But here it goes, just as I tell her. 
I was headed out for a weekend of hunting. No, I did not have to camp or rent a cabin or anything like that. I lived about 45 to 60 minutes from where I was hunting at the time, so I opted to go for the day each day and come home at night. That first morning was great, but that evening, well, let's just say I cut the weekend short, really short. There was some telltale signs that I should have known better, and not just the stories that started running through my head moments before the incident. So, but I made it to the cabin, Danny's cabin that is. I know you're probably thinking, well, I'm not a smart guy at all. I get it. I was not going to stay there, but I could have. Danny still owned it. And it's not like I never stayed there before. I did, but I never thought the stories were, well, completely true either, like I said. Although, there were some pretty mean-looking cracks on the back part of that cabin. I guess I should have known better. I parked and unpacked everything and headed down a small trail Danny, Danny cut out decades before. This would lead me to Cherry Flat, a place he dubbed after planting two cherry trees up in the middle of a sort of open area. It was not his bait, it was his wife who actually planted them. She too would go up and enjoy the place and, lo and love that little, well, it was like a tiny meadow, almost, you could call it. She planted the trees and they actually took really well to the place and produced cherries. But as for me... I got up in the deer stand about 15 to 20 feet up off the ground. It made a perfect view all the way around. Of course, in Oregon, you can't see too far into the woods here. It was thick with trees and brush, even up out of the pine. <clears throat> My mind, as I sat there, did return to Danny's story for a moment, but I lapped it off in my mind as the sun started to at least be seen on the horizon. It did not take long for me to start hearing a noise, movement directly ahead of me, up one of a, of a few game trails that cut and would wind through the forest and empty into the little meadow-like area. It's a sin. It was a buck. I could see it, barely, but I could see it come out slowly into the open area. Talk about perfect. I was about to get a buck on day one, and this was huge. This one was huge. I took up my bow, made sure I was seeing a buck. It was still rather dark, but light enough to take out, uh, to make out that I was right. It was a massive deer. I took aim, breathed out, and as I was about to fire, that thing looked up in the back of it. I let loose an arrow, but missed it, as that thing suddenly darted off back into the woods, but in my direction. Sin. It's called a sin when you miss the mark or, or a target. I was not mad at myself. It is hunting. It is what happens. Besides, this is all about the hunt and the fun of it. But it darted off so quickly right after it seemed that something had startled it. But I let it go and settled back in. It was a few more minutes when I heard something else, something new, something I never expected to hear out in the woods, especially when you're alone. Whistling. Not like bird sounds. That's chirping anyways. This was different. It was definitely whistling. It came and it and went in short bursts. I could not... I could not see who it was. But I knew they were close and moving towards the clearing and me. I sat, a bit nervous, but I sat still except for setting down my bow just in case. You never know when you might accidentally let an arrow loose like a gun and a bullet. You keep it safe. I knew it had to be the person. It had to be a person. Nothing else is out here in the woods of Oregon whistles. And I mean whistles, whistles. But that was my second mistake, assuming it was a person. The first mistake was coming out this way in the, in the first place, with its history and all. I sat still for about another minute or so until I saw movement directly ahead of me. At first, well, I, I thought I was correct. I thought I saw the silhouette of a person, and a pretty big person, but as it stepped out of the shadows that make this forest here famous, it was not a person. It was f far enough away that I could not <clears throat> make out any facial features, and to be honest, I am glad I could not. Probably would have been had even worse nightmares than I still have now, from time to time. This thing was massive, and it, it 
hid any and all sunlight that did spill through the trees along that animal trail as it stood there right in the middle of it, still and quiet all of a sudden. It was like a statue, a tall, dark, massive statue, menacing as well. You could tell by its posture that this thing, this massive creature, was not in the mood for anything but, well, I guess that deer I missed minutes earlier. It, I could tell, was in hunting mode. I have no idea how I knew that at the time, but I just felt it. I also felt that I could either be on the menu or just simply in the way, and that would end up with the same results, I thought. Me. Dead. Suddenly it moved closer to the clearing, and now I could see more of this thing. It had to be at least nine feet tall, all of nine feet tall, too. The hair was dark, but I cannot say for sure it was black. I got hints of reddish in the sunlight that did reflect off of it here and there. But it was. It was a flippin' Bigfoot. I know it sounds crazy, but it was true. Danny's story was spot on. <clears throat> I knew I had to get out of there and fast before it could sense me, smell me, or whatever they do when seeking prey while in hunting mode. I shimmy down the trees slowly and as quietly as possible, but apparently not quite enough. Once I hit the bottom, I stepped on a branch I remember seeing earlier, and it made a cracking sound that caused both of us a fright, I suppose. That thing, that Bigfoot, started wailing and wailing and screaming too. <laughs> I thought my eardrums were going to explode. I left the bow, the arrows, and only grabbed my pack and ran. I could hear this thing crashing around behind me. <clears throat> I really thought I was a dead man. I thought I was about to be a missing person story for the nightly news. But I made it to the car and dove in, turned it over, and peeled out of there. I knew that thing was right behind me, and as I looked oh, uh, once in the rearview mirror, I saw that thing run at the old... Uh, run right at the old cabin, cabin and slam it hard. I hit the first bend and was out of, it was out of sight, both me and that Bigfoot. Stories. Some are simply true. My dad's friend Danny was right. Bigfoot do exist. And today, I know this fact. I still bow hunt, but not around the Pine area. Today I travel with a friend or two always. And far away from home. That thing charged at me. Literally was chasing me, I believe. It was going to try and get me. I'm almost sure. I th thought I could have if it wanted, but it didn't. But in the end, I got away. That is all that matters to me today. Even in the occasional nightmare I have of that day, bow hunting outside Lapine, Oregon. But that is my encounter story. Thanks. Eli.